so uh, between the years of around 1840, early 1840s to around the 18, early 1870s, somewhere between the neighborhood of 300 and 400,000 people uh, left the East Coast and journeyed west. And they took a, a familiar route called the Oregon Trail, uh, which is a real trail. It's not just a video game from the 70s text-based video game, which is probably what comes to mind for so many of us when we hear the Oregon Trail. By the way, it's also pronounced Oregon Trail. I know some people will try to say, like, no, it's or Oregon or something. It's an O. Uh, it's the Oregon Trail. Anyway, so <laughs> Oregon Trail is a real thing, all right? And, you know, 300, 400,000 people traveled the Oregon Trail in that 30-year that period. And today... Uh, like 150 years after the last sojourners across the Oregon Trail made their way, we can actually still see remnants of the trail. Uh, this is actually a shot in Wyoming, uh, a, a kind of popular part of the Oregon Trail, where it, it is etched in stone. There were so many people who repeatedly went over this with their carts and their foot traffic that there is this, this etching in stone left behind 150 years after it simply because of the repetition, the repetition of feet and wheels going along it, digging this in, leaving it behind for years to come. And it, it turns out our minds can work very similarly. That when our thoughts go down a familiar path over and over and over again, it can etch these, these trenches, these ruts in our mind so that we just keep going the same way. Whenever somebody decided to go west, they didn't make, wouldn't make a new path. They would just follow the same old familiar path in the same way. Our minds, when they're triggered by certain events, they just, they'll go down the same path. Esther Smith, she says it this way. She says, when we repeatedly think the same thing over and over again. This changes the structure of our brains. Get this. This isn't just changing our minds. It's changing the structure of our physical brains at a neural level to more automatically bring that thought to mind. Our thoughts become habits that are reinforced, uh, reinforced by deep-rooted neural pathways. And so you have these thoughts Sometimes they're thoughts you don't want to have. They're thoughts, these, this overthinking, these anxious thoughts, these disruptive thoughts. And you started thinking of maybe years ago. And your mind kept going back there and back there and back there. And now it feels like our, our minds get caught in these ruts. And we can't just pull ourselves out of it. It's just our, our minds have been conditioned to go down the same familiar path after it's triggered. And so we've been in this series we call it Soundtracks. It's based, uh, inspired by uh, a book of the same name by John Acuff. Uh, it's a, a fantastic book. We encourage you to go out and grab a copy. It's not a Christian book per se, but he is a Christian and he's not really writing in a Christian context. It's more about like business and entrepreneurial stuff, but He's actually taking biblical principles and applying them. And as we were reading it, and we were being refreshed by it, we're saying, this is good stuff to share with you guys. And you guys have been confirming that. We've been hearing your feedback that you guys have been loving this series. Uh, and so we're so glad you're here with us. And we've been recognizing, the reason we're getting so much feedback is it's everyone deals with this, this overthinking, these mental ruts. We all have carved paths in our minds that we, we wish we could just step out of sometimes, but we've been conditioned over, over time to get stuck there. And the good news is we actually can change our minds. We can change our brains. It's something called neuroplasticity. It's something that 50 years ago we didn't know was a possibility, but today neuroscientists say, yeah, you can change your physical brain. Those ruts don't have to stay there anymore. And we've been looking at this one verse as a theme verse for the series from 2 Corinthians 10, where the Apostle Paul, he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive. We take every thought captive. And this is where we've been, been kind of homing in on over the last few weeks is taking our thoughts captive. Actually, not just letting them run down that old familiar path on question, but actually stopping them in their tracks and saying, wait a second, we've been asking these questions. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it kind? All right, we're taking them captain. We're asking these questions, assessing them. But that's just the beginning. This isn't where Paul st stops. He, uh, he starts by saying, yes, we need to take it captive, but then we need to do something with it. 
And I love what he says, because I actually love what he doesn't say. I love that from here, he doesn't say, all right, if you find a thought and you take it captive and you realize it's, it's not true and it's not helpful and it's not kind, that you should just kick it to the curb. Just dismiss it. Just push it out of your mind. He doesn't say that. Instead, he says, we've got to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. That's very different. He doesn't say take that thought and try to push it out of your mind. He says take that thought and you've got to reshape it. You gotta, you gotta conform it to the truth of who Jesus is and his nature and his character, what he's done for you, what he's promised to do for you, who he says you are, and make it obedient to the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done. We're reshaping it. Acuff, in his, uh, in his book, he uses these terms of retire the old soundtrack and replace it with a new soundtrack. And at first, you hear those two terms, you might think it's kind of two different steps. Like you retire this soundtrack, get it out, right? You realize it's not true, helpful, or kind, so you push it out of your mind, and now your mind is free, and you can go shopping for a nice, new, shiny soundtrack. But as he unpacks it, you realize that the retiring and replacing is not two separate activities. It's, it's the same thing. That the only way to retire these old soundtracks is to push it out with a new one, to replace it with a new one. And he uses this phrase, and I love it. He says, don't fight it, flip it. All right? So you, you have something happen in your life and, you know, this event that triggers you to kind of go down this mental path, your, your Oregon Trail, all right? You're going down these ruts, all right? And he's saying, in, instead of trying to fight that, instead of trying to prevent yourself from being triggered in that way, flip it. Flip it. Take that mental energy and use it to your advantage. So, for instance, imagine you make a mistake. You make a mistake, and it's a, it's a big me. You know, it's not like a little one. It's a bigger mistake, and I don't know what your Oregon Trail is in that, your, what your rut looks like in that, but I, I think for so many of us, you make a mistake, and you start to think, oh, man, I'm such a screw-up. And this mistake is just one of a hundred mistakes, and I just keep making these mistakes, and I'm going to keep making these mistakes, and I'm never going to amount to anything, and this is what the future holds for me. And you start to go down that, that path, and he's saying, all right, so maybe that's your broken soundtrack, and you want to retire, but don't, don't try to just push that out. What if you were to replace it? What if you were to flip it and use that trigger, all right, so that when you make the mistake and when your mind wants to go down that road, you're actually able to push it down a different road. So you make a mistake, and now it triggers you to think, wow, God, thank you for being so gracious and compassionate and forgiving. It's amazing how you take all of my worst mistakes and even the worst of my mistakes, you cover them in the blood of Christ. And you take all of these charges that could be held against me because of all of these mistakes and you've nailed them to the cross and now there's no condemnation for me. Not only that, you've clothed me in the righteousness of Christ and you've made me a temple of your Holy Spirit and you put your spirit inside of me so I have this power now. I have this power to not make the mistake again going forward. I don't have to do this anymore. What if that mistake triggered that line of thinking? Instead of it just being nothing, instead of just trying to push out the negative, what if that mistake became this trigger so that your mind automatically goes to the nature and character of God and what he's done for you and what he's promised to do for you and who you are and who he says you are, right? Don't fight that trigger, flip it and use it to your own advantage, in the, uh, the 1870s, the traffic on the Oregon Trail suddenly just dropped significantly. And over like a decade or so, it became largely non-existent. And do you know why? Do you know why people stopped taking the Oregon Trail? It wasn't, I know what you think, it wasn't because they got to the West Coast and were like, this is dumb, we should have stayed on the East Coast. The East Coast is way better. I mean, obviously that's true, but that's not. People just kept going to the West Coast. But do you know why people stopped taking the Oregon Trail? Because in 1869, after about a, a decade of, of intense planning, another six or seven years of rigorous construction, they opened the Pacific Railroad. 
It was a, a new pathway. Not one that was accidentally created just through repetition, but one that was intentionally laid out. It was a, a better pathway, a smoother pathway. And now, when people had that trigger to say, hey, let's get out of here, let's go west, they didn't go down the old familiar path. They had this new pathway, this new railway to go down that didn't end inevitably with everyone dying of dysentery. I don't know if that's true about the real Oregon Trail, but definitely in the video game, everybody died of dysentery. Uh, but this new railroad, right? So that's that same trigger sends them down a different pathway. Same trigger sends them down a different pathway. It takes work to get there, but, but you can do it. Imagine what it would be like when you experience that trigger that usually would send you into this, this spiral of anxious thinking, feeling like you're out of control, and that same event instead triggers you to say, wow, God, it's amazing that you're in control. And all you think about is how Jesus is still holding all things together. He's been holding all things together from the beginning of time. He was holding all things together when his arms were stretched out on a cross while he was lifeless. And he's holding all things together right now. And your anxious triggers trigger that thought instead. Imagine when your spouse, all right, your spouse is not reciprocating. Right? You feel like there's an imbalance in the relationship, and instead of it triggering that, that usual line of frustration and resentment, that situation triggers in you, oh man, is this, is this what it's like for God as he loves me and he looks upon me? And, and you immediately, you, your mind goes to Hosea and Gomer, and you realize, oh, God is so patient and so faithful and so selfless in his love for me. And you say, oh man, I want to love my spouse that way. Imagine if you were able to, to get out of those ruts and retrain your brain that the same triggers, instead of sending you this way, sent you to the promises of God. The promises of God. See, that's the new soundtrack that we want to replace, is the promises of God as revealed in the word of God and it might seem far-fetched to think like, oh, you know, can you actually do that? Can you actually retrain your brain that the same trigger makes you think of the promises of God? And yes. And the psalmist who wrote Psalm 119 managed to pull it off. I don't know who wrote Psalm 119. Uh, it might have been David. A lot of people think David. We don't know. But it got to this place where the promises of God revealed in the word of God became, became his default. Look what he says in verse 40 of Psalm 119. He says, how I long for your precepts, in your righteousness, preserve my life. He says, how I long for your precepts. And when he talks about the precepts here, uh, that's just a, a, a term that he uses repeatedly to refer to the whole of Scripture. So he, he's talking about the promises of God revealed in the Word of God, and he says he longs for them. I love that term, longs for them, because it, it speaks to a compulsion. It's not that he's like, oh, I should think about the, the precepts of God. No, no, no. He is compulsively drawn to the promises of God. He automatically, his mind is brought there whether he wants to go there or not. He's got to this place where the, the chaos of life triggers him to think, oh, the precepts of the Lord. Oh, man, they're amazing. God, you're amazing. And who you've made me to be is amazing. Same trigger, new soundtrack. And he got there. Now, uh, Psalm 119, super cool. Uh, I don't know if you know much about it. It's the longest psalm in all of the Psalter, uh, which, by the way, is how you refer to the whole thing, Psalter. Uh, it's fun to say. Everybody say Psalter. All right. Uh, and so it's the longest psalm in all. It's actually the longest, uh, longest chapter in all of the Bible. There's 176 verses. And this guy, whoever's writing it, loves the word of God. Because of 176 verses, 171 of them explicitly reference the word of God in some way, either precepts or commands or law or whatever. He uses some word. In 171 of the 176 verses, the word of God is referred to explicitly. And we're going to look at all 170. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to look at all 171 of them. Um, but it, it's constructed in a really cool way because the whole thing is, is constructed of these eight-verse stanzas. 
And they are lined up along like the Hebrew, it's an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. So the first eight verses, that stanza, is all like the letter A. So all eight verses start with the letter A, and the second one, all the letter B, and the letter C. And of course, it's not A, B, C, because that's not the Hebrew alphabet, but you get the gist. All right, so there's these, these stanzas, and in this particular stanza, this is how it ends. He gets to this place, and he, he says, I long, I compulsively, just automatically, my mind when it's triggered by the chaos of life, goes to the promises of God revealed in the word of God. That's where he ends. But as we look at the the seven verses that lead up to it, I think it actually shows a progression of how we get to where he got. So that you can replace those old broken soundtracks with these new ones rooted in the promises of God that are revealed in the word of God. So he starts... At the beginning of this stanza, he says, teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees that I may follow it to the end. So he starts with just the simple teach me. And this kind of is obvious. You you need to learn the word of God. You're not going to be able to go to the promises of God revealed in the word of God if you just don't know it. So we need to be learning the word of God as a, a regular habit of our lives, just actually knowing the content of Scripture and making that part of our, our daily routine. I love the way John Piper, he talks about it. Uh, he, is, uh, he uses that illustration that, sorry, my mic is hitting something. Am I okay here, guys? Am I... All right. Uh, so he uses the illustration that Scripture uses that the, the Word of God is like this, this sword, Right, it's the sword of the spirit in that when we have these broken soundtracks, we can use this sword to kind of beat those broken soundtracks into submission, make them obedient to Christ. So it's a, it's a weapon to be used for our advantage. Uh, and so he goes to this, but he says, look at what he says. He says, you can't draw the sword, the word of God, the sword from someone else's scabbard, which is, I think, the sheath. Uh, that is not a word I'm familiar with. Scabbard. Uh, if we don't wear it, we can't wield it. Right? If you don't wear the word, you can't wield the word. If the word of God does not abide in us, we will reach for it in vain when the enemy strikes. All right? If we don't know the word of God, if we aren't learning the word of God, then in those moments where those broken soundtracks come and we realize, oh, this isn't true, helpful, or kind, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, so what is true, helpful, and kind? You're going to reach for your sword and be like, oh, I left it at home. Uh, that's not very helpful in that moment. And so we start with just the simple learning the word. And that might seem obvious. I, I think it seems obvious. And yet, yet, I don't know if you know this, but two-thirds of Americans identify as Christian. Two-thirds of Americans identify as Christian. But only one-third actually have a, a regular practice of reading the Bible. So only 50% of people who identify as Christians in this country uh, I, I'm sorry, guys. Is, is this making as much noise for you as it is for me? Um, so uh, only 50% of the people that identify as Christians actually are reading the, the word of God even on like a weekly basis. And only half of that number, so only 25% are, are pushing into like a daily rhythm. And of course, we're, our minds aren't going to default to think about the promises of God revealed in the word of God if we're not regularly in the word, if we don't know what the word says. And so as uh, Robbie Gallaty, he's a pastor I like, he says it, get into the word until the word gets into you. This is the first step. We can't, we can't actually move beyond this if you're not in the word regularly. And I, I think one of the reasons we hold back from reading the word is because we, we don't understand that we're, part of the reason we're reading it is to see the promises of God to see his character revealed to us, to see who we are on account of that. Sometimes we're reading and we're just trying to find out like what we should do, which is good, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, but reading it for this purpose of trying to understand who God is, what he's done, what he's promised to do, and who you are on account of him. That's where we start. We learn it. The second thing, he goes on from there. He says, give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. So it's not enough to simply know the word. We need to understand it. Uh, Again, this one probably seems a little obvious. It makes me think of my daughter. My daughter is uh, three and a half, and she's getting to that place where she just starts singing songs and, like, singing along with things that she hears. But she doesn't really understand 
the songs uh, or the words. So she just sings along and she just like makes up words. They're not even words half the time. They're just like, it's just gibberish. But because she doesn't understand the words, her gibberish is no more nonsensical than the actual words. She just doesn't understand it. And sometimes I think we can, we can engage the word of God and we can be reading it, but it's just kind of words that are out there and it doesn't really mean anything to us because we're not, we're not capturing the message of it. We're not taking that time to, to understand what scripture is saying. We're not taking the time to understand what scripture is telling us about who God is and what he's done for us in Christ and what he's promised for us in Christ and who you are because of Christ. There's actually this moment where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Pharisees knew the Bible better than any of us in this room. Uh, I think I could say that. They just, they knew it inside. It. They had like massive portions of it memorized, if not the whole thing memorized. They knew it. And Jesus still says to them, you study the scriptures di- diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. So they were studying it. They knew the words, but they were missing what it's about. They weren't able to connect how it was, it was pointing to Jesus. Now, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he, when he talks about the scriptures, he's not talking about the New Testament. The New Testament hasn't been written yet, right? He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures pointing to Jesus. This is a key work of us trying to understand the scriptures is understanding, not simply like, oh, how do I use this as a, a guide to make better decisions? That's a good thing to do. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying, how do we read and understand scripture to the point where we get how it's pointing to who God is, what he's done for us in Christ, what he's promised to do for you in Christ, and who you are in Christ. So for instance, uh, in this series, we've been talking a lot about David and Saul and kind of pulling things out of their stories. And take the, the, the story of David and Goliath. It's one of the most famous Bible stories. And it's easy for us to read it and be like, oh, let's be like David and be you know, courageous and go and fight giants. And there's something in that, but that's not why it was written. If you think about the original audience, this was, this was their history book. This wasn't a, like a fable to inspire morality. This was them actually reading the history of God protecting their nation. And they are reading this, and they're seeing that there's this moment in their history for you know, the original audience, not too distant history, where the world put forward its best, this giant to come and attack the, the meager armies of God. This is the best the world could muster up, this giant Goliath. And God comes to the rescue, and he sends in a child. God's like, ha, ah, the best the world can throw at me, child's play. I'm going to send in a child, and I'm going to defeat these armies. And the, the original audience is reading, our God sees the enemies of this world coming against his people, and it's child's play to him. It's, he, he can conquer them in, in a moment. He is so much mightier, more powerful. And then we read ahead, and we get to, to Jesus, and we realize our, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, that we're not worried about the physical Goliath. We're, we're battling much bigger giants. These spiritual forces of darkness coming against us, the, the problem of sin and guilt and all of that, these giants that stand against us. And what does God do? He sends in a child. He says, it's a child's play to me. So this time he sends in his own child. So not only do we get to see God's power on display showing that he is so much more powerful than any giant that's standing against you, but you get to see his affection for you when he does so through his own child, willing to sacrifice them for you. And we're able to read these stories in the Old Testament. We're seeing, this is telling me something about the heart of God for me. It's telling me something about who I am. I'm his. In the same way he sent David to fight the battles for Israel, he sent Jesus in to fight for me. Because I'm his. So understanding scripture, and I will admit, this is much harder to do than reading it. <laughs> Some of you are like, I can't do that. Uh, and, and, and I get that, but you could learn. And that's why we do things like discipleship classes. I have really good news for you guys. We have a class this Tuesday that Robert's teaching uh, where he's gonna equip you with tools to be able to not just read God's word, but to understand it. 
to understand the implications of it, to pull these things out. So as you're reading it, you're not just finding out, oh, what do I do with this? But understanding, you're actually forming these new soundtracks in your minds. And so if you don't have plans Tuesday, come on out to that class. If you do have plans Tuesday, cancel them, unless it's alpha, uh, and come on out to that class. And if you've already taken that class, jump in on one of the other discipleship classes because this is what the discipleship classes are about. They're, they're trying to teach you and equip you to not just know the word, but to understand it and to understand who God is, what he's done for you, what he's promised to do for you, and who you are in light of what he says about you so you can, you can actually build these new soundtracks. Then he goes on, And he says, direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find the light. He says, direct me. Direct me. Let your word direct me. This is the third piece of laying that track, right? This is the hard work of laying the track, being directed by God's word. And I, this word, I love it and I hate it (laughs) because I would much rather be influenced by God's word than directed by God's word. Being influenced by God's word means that I can still do my thing and I'll just do it God's way. I can pursue whatever thing I want to pursue. I can kind of set the trajectory of my life and I'll do it God's, I'll be influenced by his morals and his values and all of that, but I'm still going to do my thing. But directed, directed, that's a different thing. He says, no, 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 you need to be directed by the word. The reason this is so important is because if if your life is being directed by something other than God's word, and you're, you're saying, I'm, all right, I'm going to do my thing, but I'm going to do it God's way. So I'll be influenced by God's word, not directed. But the problem with that is there's going to come a point where doing things God's way is going to interfere with the direction of your life if it's not directed toward the purposes of God. So if you're pursuing you know, career success, and you're saying, yeah, but I'm going to do it God's way. I'm going to do what God's, I'm going to do with integrity and all of that and honesty. There's going to come a moment where, where if you're pursuing career success, you're going to have to make a decision. Am I going to be honest and have integrity here or not? Because that, that, that trajectory of your life is being, going to be contingent on, say, you know, maybe stretching the truth a little bit or doing something that's kind of off color. And here's the thing. Even if you submit to God's way in that moment, or even if you say, all right, I'm going to do it your way, God, there's going to be this, this resentment. Because God's way is now getting in the way of your purposes. Right? If, if your purpose in life is to fulfill the American dream and have the nice house and the nice neighborhood with the, you know, kids that go to the good schools and all of that, then you say, yeah, I'm going to do it God's way and I'm going to be generous. But there's going to come a moment where like, being sacrificial and generous is going to impede impede the trajectory of your life. And in that moment, God's way is going to feel like a straitjacket. It's going to feel like an obstacle that's standing between you and your happiness. If you say, I just want to suck all of the, you know, the best out of life. I want to make it as pleasurable and enjoyable. And I want to be as comfortable as possible in this life. And yeah, I'm going to do it God's way. But there's going to come a moment where God's way is going to feel like it's getting in the way of your purposes. And even if you submit to his way in that moment, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like a burden. It's going to feel like a burden. And this is so important. You might be wondering, well, like, what does it have to do with the soundtracks? It's so critical because look what he says. He says that being directed by the path of his commands, he finds delight in it. There's this delight <laughs> that comes in being directed by the Lord's commands. And and here's the thing. If our lives aren't being directed by the purposes of God, right? If your life is not being directed by the purposes of God, your heart will not find delight in the promises of God. Even if you're willing to do things God's way, if your, your life is not being directed by the purposes of God, your heart is not going to find delight in the promises of God. 
It's going to find them to be a burden. And some of you know what I'm talking about because you know the promises of God. You know the character of God. You even understand it. You've done that. And the promises of God, they just feel kind of like abstract and distant and they don't, don't really bring any joy. You know they're there, but they just don't feel like they're very valuable to you. And could it be that maybe you're allowing God's word to influence your life, but, but it's not directing your life? That it's still being directed by just the pattern of the world instead of this pursuit to, to seek first the kingdom of God. To let your life be directed by his great commission to go and make disciples. See, this is the, the hard work of laying the track. But when you let your life be directed by the purposes of God, the delight starts to come. And this is where he goes next. He says, turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain, all right? So now he's talking about his heart being turned, right? It's his affections being enraptured, his affections being enraptured by the promises of God. And now we've laid the track work and we get to just ride the train where we have these enraptured affections and then he says, turn my eyes. So first it was turn my heart. Now it's turn my eyes away from worthless things and preserve my life according to your word. And and here's the thing. Whatever enraptures your affections is going to capture your attention. This is why this is so critical to the the discussion of soundtracks and where your mind is going to go compulsively because whatever enraptures your affections is going to capture your attention. And if you don't know the promises of God and you don't understand the promises of God and your life isn't being directed by the purposes of God, it's never going to enrapture your affections. And it's not going to capture your attention. But you guys know that whatever enraptures your affections is going to capture your attention, right? You guys remember your first crush? Whoever that was, real person, celebrity, somebody on a poster, I don't know. Uh, whoever enraptured your affections, nobody had to tell you to think about them, right? They just captured your attention. Whatever enraptures your affections is going to capture your attention. But when we are being directed by the purposes of God, all of a sudden, our hearts become enraptured with affection for the promises of God, and it captures our attention. He goes on, he says, fulfill your promise to your servants so that you may be feared, all right? Fulfill your promise, and now he's looking around, and he's actually, he has his eyes open to see the moments when God's promises are going to be fulfilled in his life, and he's looking for all the ways that, that God's faithfulness is realized in his world right here. And you guys know what this is like. You've had those moments where like God just shows up, and you see his faithfulness, and it's just this, this infusion of joy that enraptures your affections, even if it's just for a moment, and recaptures your attention. To live in that, and this, this does take a little bit of effort. Acuff in his book, he says, you have to gather some evidence of what you want to be true in your life. This is not a passionate, uh, this is not a passive experience. Proof won't find you. You have to find it. Fear comes free. Faith takes work. I love that. And this is what the psalmist is doing. He's actually, he's looking now to see the ways that God is going to show up, that his, his faithfulness is going to be realized in this life. And then as the train is coming into the station, he says this, take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. Take away the disgrace I, I dread. Do you know what happens when God takes away the disgrace that you dread? He also takes away the, dis, the dread of disgrace. And how many of your broken soundtracks, your broken, untrue, unhelpful, unkind soundtracks are centered around this theme of dreading disgrace? Justin talked about this last week with shame and just how we get to this place where we're we're consumed with not just what we've done, but who we are. And we fear being found out, that, that shame being exposed to the world, that dread of disgrace. And here, the psalmist is realizing, no, 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 God is going to take away the, dis- the, dr- the disgrace I dread, which along with it means the dread of disgrace goes out the window. And dread is neutralized. Because he did the work of laying that track, of learning the word, understanding the word, and being directed by the word of God. He was able to be enraptured by the promises of God, captured by these promises, see the faithfulness realized and dread neutralized and cry out, 
oh, how I long for your precepts, how my mind just compulsively goes to your precepts. It's triggered by this chaos, and my mind just goes over here. So my question for you is, where are you in laying this track? It's work. It's going to take effort, but you have the resources to learn the word. Maybe this is where you need to start, that just carving out time to actually get into the word until the word gets into you. Do you understand the word? Do you have the tools? Are you, you making effort to understand it more? Are you giving time when you read it to actually think about it? Are you jumping in on those D classes? Because these are not, we offer these not as like the next level, like super spiritual. We know without these, these truths that you're not gonna be able to develop new soundtracks or maybe you know it, maybe you understand it. And maybe you're in this place where you're not quite sure you're ready to be directed by God's purposes. This is likely where it's gonna fall apart for so many of us. Where we want control, we wanna just follow the pattern of the world, we wanna kind of do what's normal and God is saying, no, 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 I have a different purpose for you. If you just, just surrender to me, let your life be directed by his purposes so that your heart would delight in his promises. So that you, like the psalmist, could get to that place where you're triggered and your mind just goes to the promises of God revealed in the word of God. And it's delightful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. God, we acknowledge all the ways that we underestimate your word and its power in our lives and what it can do and who you are and what you're revealing to us. And God, I just pray that you would ignite a fire in all of us that, like the psalmist, we would just fall in love with your word. Fall in love with it. Long for it. God, I pray that you will help us uh, develop these new soundtracks to lay, lay the track, do the work to lay the track so we could just ride that train delighting in you glorifying you pray this in Jesus name amen